Um, all right, hi everyone, I'm Christine. This summer I had the opportunity to work in the Pryhuber Lab at the University of Rochester Medical Center. And I want to preemptively thank all the members of my lab. They really made my entire summer. It was so fun working with them. Um, a little bit about me, I am a senior at Smith College and I'm majoring in biochemistry. Um, and my project this summer is about the spatial distribution of mast cells and asthma versus non-asthma donors. Um, so a little bit of background, let's see. Um, so previous research has shown that mast cells are linked to the pathogenesis of asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the lower or more distal airways of the lung. Um, asthma is characterized by contraction of smooth muscle in airways and also increased mucus secretion. This results in more difficulty breathing. And mast cells are leukocytes or white blood cells that inhabit tissues. They originate from bone marrow and they also are known to accumulate around the airways of asthma patients. Um, we hypothesize that any differences we find in the spatial distribution between asthma and non-asthma donors will support previous observations that mast cells do indeed play a role in the asthmatic response. Um, so there are some key structures I'm gonna talk about. Um, first, there are airways, which are also known as the bronchi or bronchioles. Bronchi are bigger airways, bronchioles are smaller airways, and they just carry air to and from the alveoli, which is where gas exchange occurs. And then vessels is just vasculature, and they are just arteries and veins that circulate blood throughout the lung. Um, the objectives of my study were to identify differences in spatial distribution and enumeration of mast cells between asthma and non-asthma donors as well as between airways and vessels in the lung. So there's two levels of analysis going on. One is the enumeration of mast cells, like how many mast cells are there around airways or vessels. And then there's the distribution, which is how far away mast cells are from the different structures or how far they are from airways and vessels. And then there's two comparisons I'm making. One, I'm comparing asthma and non-asthma donors. And then I'm also comparing airways and vessels. Um, all right, so here are some of the donors that I used. I chose six donors total. Three of them were non-asthma lung donors, and then three of them had asthma. Um, so there's donor 239, 265, and 292. They are the non-asthma donors. And then 288, 294, and 376 are the asthma donors. Um, one thing to note is that asthma donors, all these asthma donors died from asthma. So they had acute fatal asthma. They had extreme cases and that, you know, will show up later on in the slides that I'll show. Um, oh, and the donors were chosen using Brindle, which is the biorepository for investigation of diseases of the lung. It's just like a data bank for lung donors and like their demographics, characteristics, and so on. Um, oh, and another thing to note is that these were all adults between 23 and 37 years old. So they're within like a similar demographic. I tried to choose that way. Um, all right, so here are my methods. Basically, we just cut and prepared our slides. Um, we cut formal and fixed paraffin embedded lung with a microtome. Um, we made one slide per donor to look at. We stained the slide with a 45 marker antibody panel. And then we ran the slide through the Akoya phenocycler fusion machine, which results in multiplex fluorescent images. I will talk more about that a little bit later. Um, from that image, um, we collected, I collected data in QPath. Um, and then from that data, I analyzed it in R and got my results. Let's see. All right, so here is the Akoya phenocycler and phenoimager. This is a picture from our lab. Um, it is a fully automated system that binds barcoded antibodies to its complementary fluorescent reporter. And it gives you multiplex fluorescent imaging. Um, basically, when we stain the slides, we stain the slides with barcoded antibodies, um, but we can't see any structures until the antibodies are bound to their complementary fluorescent reporter. And that's what the phenocycler does. And then the imager just images the fluorescent image. On the right, you can see the phenoimager. Um, and then the left is the phenocycler. 
Um, now you may be wondering what are barcoded antibodies and reporters? Um, barcodes are just short oligonucleotides. Um, antibodies are the protein that binds to the epitopes of the structures we are looking at. Um, reporters are just fluorochrome, so they will fluoresce under fluorescent lighting, and that's how we see the image later on. Um, we can see in, let's see, oh yeah, we can see in A that um, antibodies and, actually here, let me see, so corresponding barcodes will bind to each other, and that will allow the structures to fluoresce. Um, there we have an antibody barcode complex, which is put onto the slide with the tissue. And the antibody and the barcode are separate entities at first. So we have to conjugate those together. And that's what's known as antibody conjugation. That is just covalently bonding the two structures together. Um, and then there's also a reporter barcode complex and that goes on a reporter plate and is put into the phenocycler to be washed onto the plate later on. Um, the two barcodes on both the antibody barcode complex and the reporter barcode complex, they will um, interact with each other and they'll bind. And then that's what will cause it to fluoresce. So each barcode has like one pair basically that it will bind to. Um, let's see, there are also only three channels that you can only put on three, um, three, three reporters at a time. So although we're running a 45 plate, um, 45 marker plate, you, you can't run them all at once. We, they go on three at a time, they'll bind, and then they'll be imaged and they'll be washed off. And then another three will come on. So it takes a really long time to do the imaging. I think one plate takes about 12 hours to run. So it's a very timely process. Um, yeah, let's see, okay, so. The markers of interest, these are a subset of the 45 marker panel. Um, the top three are the ones that I actually used in my analysis. And then everything else below that is just what I like used. I toggled on and off to look at the structure and use them as like little landmarks to look around. Um, so TPSAB1 is a tryptase marker and that is how you look for a mast cell. Um, mast cells express tryptase, and they are a key component of the granules that mast cells um, secrete. Um, mast cells would de will degranulate during activation, so then tryptase is expressed. Um, I chose to make them green in my images. The other marker is SMA, that's smooth muscle actin, and they show up discontinuously in airways, so they don't form a full ring around the airways they will kind of be dotted around the airway and then around vessels, they are continuous and I chose to make them teal. Pancytokeratin or PANCK is pancytokeratin and that is the epithelial marker in um, airways. And I made those red. Um, some other ones I used were TP63 and keratin-5, which are basal cells. And then collagen 1A1 is type one collagen, um, MUC5AC, I used to look for mucus and goblet cells in larger airways. CD31 um, and caviolin, they both show vasculature. Um, yeah, all right, let's see. And then, so QPath is what I use to analyze my slides. QPath is a software which allows for full slide viewing, spatial phenotyping, and analysis. Um, I included a screenshot of a pop-up in QPath where you can toggle on and off all the different markers. And you can see there's so many that I just haven't really used yet. And that you can see I have trip days toggled on for this. Um, okay, so here are some images that I got. This is donor 288 um, and what I labeled as airway two. And let me identify some structures first so we know what we're looking at. Um, so, this is the airway and I have mast cells as the green dots around the airway. So you can see them, they're kind of hard to see, it's a little bit small. And then the pancytokeratin, the epithelial layer within the airway, that is this red green right here. That's how you know it's an airway. There is discontinuous muscle around the airway. So that's these teal spots right here, that's smooth muscle. Um, let's see, and then, so A is just showing a screenshot of 
airway two with no QPath analysis at all. Um, B is showing a manual annotation I made of airway two in QPath. I'm following collagen lines, which I didn't toggle on collagen for this screenshot, but um, it just encompasses the extracellular matrix around the airway. And all the analysis done within QPath occurs inside each annotation. So on each slide, I will choose a few individual airways or vessels, make an annotation around them, and then do my analysis within those annotations. Um, panel C shows the cell detections that were made using the Stardust extension in QPath. Basically, it uses DAPI to detect nuclei. Um, so it's going to highlight every single cell within the annotation. Um, I annotated which cells were mast cells and which ones were not. And you can train this pixel classifier to detect the number of mast cells within that annotation. And then panel D shows a pixel threshold. Um, we can see this red ring again. It's a little bit brighter than in the other photos. And that's because it's I chose to mask the pancytokeratin in this airway. And from there, it like identifies it as like a little structure and you can measure the distance between mast cells to the pancytokeratin. Um, yeah, that's how I did my analysis. It's just showing what I saw on QPath. Let's see. Here are more pictures of just airway and vascular features in these lung tissue sections. Oh, I probably should have mentioned earlier that there it's like a cross section of lung. So we're looking, it's like cutting straight through the airways. And the reason why there's so much space in the, um, like there's so much just blank space is because these um, lungs were inflated with formalin. So it stretched them out. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing I should have noted too is that these like little no, I'm, around here, I'm that is still trying to get that uh, alveolar re regions in the lung. And that's where the gas exchange is occurring. So here is, um, these two pictures, there's one, there's the non-asthma donor 265 on the left, and then donor 294 with asthma on the right. And I just wanted to show like a picture with collagen toggled on, and then an example of like how I followed the collagen in my annotation. And another thing I wanted to show too is even though both these slides followed a pretty similar staining procedure, they still turned, they had different brightnesses and stuff. So it's just depends on slide to slide how things will turn out. Um, okay, here is more structural differences in asthma versus non-asthma slides. So on the left, I have the non-asthma donor 235, 239, sorry, airway one and vessel one. Um, this was imaged in March, 2024. And then the asthma slide donor two, um, 294, airway four. And you can see that in the non-asthma, slide the airway is very like it's like open and relaxed the muscle is like still discontinuous around it um but when you look at this airway in the asthma donor you can see like that muscle is a continuous line around the airway it's like super contracted airway so you can really like see the effects of asthma here um it also looks like the mast cells are a little bit more spread out in the non-asthma slide like they're all out here versus in the asthma slide, they seem to be more clustered around the asthma airway. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to show what some differences visually look like. Let's see. All right, so now we're getting into some results. So the data I collected in QPath, I ran in R. This graph shows the number of um, mast cells around like airways and vessels and between um, asthma and non-asthma donors. However, instead of just using showing the pure number of mast cells, I divided the number of mast cells by the perimeter of each annotation. This just to account for the different sizes of different airways and vessels. Otherwise, that might skew the data a little bit. And I found that there are always a greater number of mast cells around the airways compared to vessels. And you can see this like here is a, the asthma donors are in blue and there's more asthma donors in the airways than sorry, there's more mast cells in the asthma donors around the airways compared to the vessels. And same with non-asthma donors, you can see there's a lot more mast cells um, around the airways than the vessels. Um, and both the p-values are super low, so it is a significant difference. Um, the one thing to note here though, is when I compared asthma versus non-asthma donors, 
there appeared to be less mast cells in asthma donors compared to non-asthma donors, which is interesting because I would expect the opposite since mast cells are linked to that asthmatic response you would assume there might be more. So that was just an opposite finding that I would like to learn more about and like why that happened. Um, okay, so this is a very similar looking graph, but this is showing the distance between mast cells to either pancytokeratin in the airways or to SMA, smooth muscle in the vessels. And the one significant difference we found is that mast cells are closer to the airway epithelium in asthma donors. So although they're um, actually, no, they're just, they just sit closer to the airway itself. I guess it makes sense because it looked more clustered in the photo anyways, and the P is 0.03. So that is another significant difference. All right, to summarize, there are just more mast cells around airways than vessels. And although there are fewer mast cells around the airways of asthma donors, they are clustered more tightly around those airways. Um, just an interesting observation. Um, and to conclude, the results of our statistical analysis do support previous observations that the spatial distribution of mast cells play a role in the asthmatic response. And some pot potential next steps I could take were would be to investigate the biological mechanisms and structures behind why these differences are occurring. Like why are there less around the asthma donors? Or I can continue this and look for trends within different age groups, or maybe apply the same analysis to a different lung disease, such as bronchopulmonary dysplasia, BPD in infants. Yeah, and then my takeaways for the summer is be proactive. Don't be scared to ask for help. Research is very collaborative, I've come to realize. Um, your mentors and lab mates are also human. They, um, I had so much fun in my lab just talking to everyone, so it was great. Research is fun and setbacks can be discouraging, but don't let that hold you back. And then this was just a really pivotal experience for me. Um, I wasn't sure if research is something I could do like after graduation during my gap years before grad school. And now I've realized I do want to continue doing research after graduation. So, yeah. And then I would like to thank um, my PI, Dr. Pry Huber, and then um, Dr. Perkinson, who helped me with my project at University of Rochester Medical Center. And then I'd also like to thank the HubMap Consortium the coordinators of our internship. So Sophia, Maya, and then AJ, thank you guys all for coordinating this. Um, yep, references, and thank you.